In the name of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Has there ever been a time when you felt moved by something that is mysterious? Has there been a time, moment in your life, when you can feel so close to God that you keep silent about it? It's personal, it's precious. I think that was in the minds of Peter and John and James as they came down that mountain. There are times at a spiritual retreat, for example, when an individual experience of God's presence happens to a person in a way that stirs the soul. Truth is, truth is that each of us each and every one of us stands at the threshold of such a divine encounter. And when this happens, we come away from those moments changed. We find ourselves open to new ways of seeing, realizing, embracing fresh insights, new avenues of thinking, and ultimately transformed ways of being. We are refreshed in spirit. We are more intentionally receptive to an awareness of God's loving presence. That is what happened on that mountain. And today offers us such an opportunity. In our gospel passage today, we are supremely privileged, you know, to focus on an exquisite experience of a documented human encounter with a vision of the divine presence. St. Luke tells us that Jesus took Peter and John and James up the high mountain for a time of prayer. Now this by itself would not have been all at all unusual. It was something that Jesus loved to do. We know that he often took time apart. Scripture tells us this. He would go to the mountains or to a solitary place and there in that solitude pray, usually alone. But this time was different. On this occasion, he invited these three friends to accompany him. And these, by the way, are the same three disciples, Peter, John, and James, who just about a year later would be with him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he experiences passion after that Passover last supper. But we're not there yet. In today's gospel, however, St. Luke tells us that while they were on that mountain and Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became Dazzling white. Now, what do you make of that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I suspect. I suspect that the heavenly splendor of Jesus' inward divinity and the vision of his soul overflowed onto his physical body, permeated his garments so that Peter and James and John saw our Lord standing before them a vision of intense brightness, perfect, radiant purity. That's what I think happened. That's what Scripture says. And we trust it. But to add to that vision of Christ clothed in glory, suddenly and miraculously, Moses and Eliyahu, Elijah, appeared also in radiant splendor. And they began conversing with Jesus about his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. These two men, spiritual giants of the faith of Israel, 
whose lives on earth, by the way, had been separated by as much as 700 years, were present together with Jesus in sight of these disciples at the same place, at the same time. Now wrap your minds around that. Now here's the first thing that comes to mind, for me at least. Moses and Eliyahu, Elijah, those ancient patriarchal leaders of Israel had been gone for centuries. The disciples would have heard of them and read about them from scriptures. But now they are witnessing them standing right there in front of them. They are actually real. They see them. They still exist. What does that say to you? I'll tell you what it says to me. Their presence reveals that there truly is life after this earthly existence. That's what it says. We don't die and then simply cease to exist completely. No, no, not a bit. But you know, my sisters and brothers in Christ, this is not the only kind of glorious revelation that we, you and I, are able to get a glimpse of in this life. See, it's not only around death that we are blessed with an experience of something special from God. The sting of death sometimes dulls our spiritual senses. But there are other occasions, you see, that bless us, that touch our awareness, our spiritual awarenesses, to encounter the divine. Think of Moses. You see, God grants so many people other glimpses of glory. Remember, as I said, Moses, he was a fugitive, and he heard the voice of the Lord speak to him out of a burning bit of shrubbery. And later, on the mountain, he was privileged to see the presence of God passing by and God identifying God's self in terms of mercy and love and forgiveness that is unlimited. And later, Moses' face shone with a special light whenever he entered the tabernacle to commune with God. Think also of Eliyahu, Elijah. And he, lots of healings, miracles, raising people from the dead, but then, when Jezebel was after him, he got scared and he ran and hid in a cave. And the Lord was pretty upset with him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Earthquake, wind, fire to shake one's consciousness. But he learned that God was not there to destroy him. He learned... He discovered that God was still with him in the intimacy of a gentle whisper of love. Despite the ways in which he tested God's patience. Think also about Paul. Who saw and heard Jesus speaking to him as he traveled to Damascus. Intent on persecuting Jesus' earliest followers in the way. But that's in our religious history. I want us to focus on the here and the now because we are in this together, each and every one of us. Hold that to your heart. That is the truth, God's truth. You see, even more immediately and timely for us here, I want you to think of those you know who have shared moments of a vision that was a gift of insight from God. Can you identify? I'm sure you can. Or perhaps like Jacob on Mount Horeb, when that rascal had nothing but stone for a pillow, had this dream. Think of someone who was sure that Jesus or God or an angel visited them in their sleep and comforted them or told them what they should do. Ah, 
These moments, I've been convinced, are not uncommon. For my own part, I can tell you, I can testify, I can confirm that these do occur. I used to be a pretty stubborn-willed young man. And I experienced it not once, not twice, three times. Changed my life forever. I know that these occur. I know that here, some of you here and others witnessing our time together have similar stories to tell. I know that persons here in this congregation today, I know that you've shared with me times when you've had a vision that soon proved afterwards to be a source of comfort and much-needed spiritual support. So it happens among us. There we have it. You see, we can never quite deny or forget such moments because our lives are never quite the same afterwards. On the mountain of the transfiguration, the voice of God from the brilliance of the overshadowing cloud said to the disciples, and you heard how Father Lee emphasized it, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Listen to him. Not to Moses, not to Elijah. Listen to Jesus. Now I want you to remember what instruction, what pledge did Jesus give to his disciples? He said to them, as the Father has loved me, Father said, this is my son, my chosen. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. Those are his instructions. And later he promised, I will be with you always, even unto the end of time, the end of the ages. The one who is from everlasting to everlasting says that. So do we listen? Yeah, most times I think we do. But acknowledging it, however, can be a struggle. <laughs> like Peter and John and James, they kept their mouths shut. People might laugh at you. I wonder if you are familiar with the story of a man who was lost in the desert. And he was certain that he was going to die there. But he made it out. And later he described his difficult ordeal to his friends, and he told them how in sheer desperation, in despair, he knelt down in the midst of that wilderness and cried out to God to help him. And so his friends asked him, did God answer your prayer? You know what he said? <laughs> he said oh, no, 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 he didn't actually. But funny thing, funny thing. Before he could, this guy showed up suddenly and showed me the way home. <laughs> I made it home. You see, we do live in a very human world. People tend to want to be able to be pragmatic. And situations when a touch of the divine occurs can be difficult to recognize. But you know, our ancestors in the faith have always known this and they've taught it to us. I'm an Anglican. I was nurtured in the spirituality of the English church, of which the Celtic Christians are an essential part. The mothers of the Celtic tradition refer to that sort of place as thin places where it is like the veil is permeable. They overlap. There, things of the spirit and things of flesh come together. And heavenly things are 
felt and experienced with greater clarity here on earth. And I know that you have experienced that. It's personal. I know it. The thing is to recognize it. And the thing is to know when you are being transformed, transfigured. It's not just Jesus. It's not just Moses and Eliyahu. It's not just Peter and John and James. It's you and you and you and you and you. Your families and friends. Us all. We are participants in this. Participants in this dimension of sacred mystery. The account of the transfiguration, you see, is an invitation. That's what it is, an invitation for us to be open to spiritual awareness in our daily walk of life, to be attentive to the action of the divine in our lives. Peter and John and James witnessed Christ's div divine beatified presence on that holy mountain. And Peter, in his epistle, wants us to experience it. He says, I'm about to die. My time on earth is almost done, but I want you to know this. He wants us to share in this wonderful, life-altering experience. That is what he so deeply desires for us. And he says to us, we will do well. We will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's what Peter is saying to us here this morning. Simply put, pay attention. Be open to recognize the times that we, like the disciples, have witnessed someone's time of transfiguration along with the times that you yourself may have had a dream or a vision, an intuition that later has helped you. And you've learned to trust it because you are putting your trust in the Lord who is with you always. God was with him on that mountain, helped him to stay the course and go forward to do it. That's the invitation for us. It's an invitation for us to be what it is that God has purposed for each one of us in our lives. And that is to be transformed into the persons he's made each and every one of us to be, to grow into the fullness of Christ. That's it. And remember, he's with you always, ready to grant more than we can ever ask or deserve. Who could ever ask for anything more? I don't know. Amen. Amen.